Hello and welcome to you another Doctor's Assistant 1 video and today I'm doing another classic series Doctor Who review of um, the seventh Doctor, played by Thalys McCoy's Battlefield, which is the first episode in season 26. Unfortunately the last of uh, series of uh, um, classic Doctor Who. You've got Sylvester McCoy years 1987 to 19. 89, PG, Sylvester McCoy, yes, Sylvester McCoy there, uh, you've got Anselin, I think, no, Morgan even, <laughs> um, you've got the Destroyer, you've got the Brigadier, and then those two Warrior dudes, Battlefield, Doctor Who, BBC DVDs, BBC, Two Entertainment, Battlefield, Sylvester McCoy, Doctor Who, uh, you've got starring Sylvester McCoy, um, you've got the synopsis, special features and whatnot, all legal guff and the reel of images at the top. You've got two discs this time, um, with sort of fairly decent print printed stuff on there. Then you've got the writer's notes and other information on the inside of the booklet. Um yeah, I mean I know a lot of people probably don't like this story, but I have quite a soft spot for it and I think it's because I I don't know, I really have a soft spot for it because I think there's, um, I think it was one of the earliest Sylvester McCoy stories that I ever got, so it's one of the earliest episodes that I was ever exposed to his Doctor, and I think it showcases his Doctor fairly well actually, you know, you've got quite a bit of the humour, you know, you've got bits where it's like popping the c packet of crisps, uh, popping the packet of crisps and waking up those people and then being like, oh, good morning, <laughs> and all that, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, you know, you've, I think from season 26, um, which I do have fully, so I can sort of quickly go over those episodes in my head, um, I think it's probably one of the episodes that does sort of nod to the past a bit more than other episodes, and I have a little theory that usually, with Doctor Who in particular, that when it nods to the past and or has the past in an episode or in an era a bit too much, um, then it kind of can feel hindering, uh, but here it's done fairly well. Um, the Doctor and Ace relationships are really well done. Um, you know, you get this sense, uh, you know, you've got this sense of the Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Master Plan, uh, like the head writer, uh, the script writer, um, Andrew Cartmel, um, had this plan, so it's referred to as Doctor Who fan, to, it's referred to by Doctor Who fans as the Cardinal pl Master Plan, which was that they were going to add a lot more mysteriousness and mystique and mysterious stuff to the Doctor and make him, you know, you know, have a reason for, you know, the question, Doctor Who, you know, question mark who, you know, uh, is he? And this is a good example of that, you know, they, they really did try and interject quite a lot of new stuff here, you know, uh, with the mystery of who he is, you know, with the Merlin stuff. And, um, yeah, I think at the time when I was really younger, at like sort of 11 or 12, so this would have been, I'd have probably got this, what, back in 2008, 2009, so around about series 3, maybe series 4, a push, maybe. Um, because I really, I, I got into Classic Doctor Who around series 3 of the new series, uh, of the revived series, and, um, and so yeah, I think, I think I probably got this one, as I say, it's one of the earliest, um, if not the first Sylvester McCoy story I, I had, maybe one of the earliest that I can remember anyway. It's, um, written by Ben Aronovich, who also wrote... Uh, Remembrance of the Daleks as well, which is easily the episode that overshadows this one, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's because, you know, you've got Daleks and Davros in that one, but you've also got all the Michael Bay explosions, whereas you've got all the Michael Bay explosions in this episode, but no Daleks or Sidemen or, you know, Autons or anything from the past to sort of, I don't know, make it epic and cool, you know, you've not got that substance, that context to these bad guys in these, this world, so... You know, um, you know, yeah, it adds mystery to the Seventh Doctor and just the Doctor generally with the whole Merlin thing. The Doctor and Ace's relationship is strong as ever and really good. Um, and that they've got a diverse cast of people, you know, with the blind woman, that Asian lass who ends up sort of being somewhat infatuated with Ace, uh, um, which at the time I never saw it as sort of a lesbian relationship, but I guess in retrospect, yeah, it's fairly obvious. Um, the Destroyer's pretty cool, um, and that 
Um, the music isn't the most abrasively sort of in-your-face music ever, which is saying something because I usually complain about the music in Classic Who. Um, action, there's a lot of it, so it's great on the action front. Um, nice references to the past uh, with Bessie and some other stuff. I really like that bit with the coins uh, and that, with like the uh, coinage and that of that one piece of coin stuff moving and that like an insect thing. I really like that bit. Um, I love the way the TARDIS is set, like set. The TARDIS set is lit even uh, right at the beginning of the episode. Really cool. Really sets a sort of dark tone for the beginning of the episode, which is kind of weird because the rest of the episode's very much shot on location and is very open and gives you this sort of feeling of sort of safety, which is weird considering the context of the episode. And there's a lot of death and explosions and yeah, <laughs> um, really cool, epic. Epic stuff, really, and I think of all the Doctors, you can believe uh, the Seventh Doctor being like Merlin, you know, because he's this sort of mysterious mystique. Oh, there's this mysterious mystique about him, and almost this sort of magical oomph and air about him, you know, uh, and that. I think, anyway, with Sylvester McCoy and how he portrayed the Seventh Doctor, that's how I perceive him, anyway, as this sort of trickster and this sort of... Um, manipulator and arch yeah manipulator and that gets developed and uh whatnot in later stories in season 26 um unfortunately uh from 1963 to 2015's what husbands of river song even statistically speaking this is the lowest viewed uh doctor who episode in terms of the overnight like viewing figures like on the night should I say not overnight on the night viewing figures it is statistically speaking the lowest viewed uh, Doctor Who episode which is really bad and I can kind of see why obviously in season 26 it didn't get or after season 26 it didn't continue on seeing as as I said this is the lowest rated Doctor Who episode in terms of statistically speaking the numbers um for the episode you know overnight or on the night should I say um from you know, Unearthly Child to Husbands of River Song, which is really sad. Um, bad points. Um, I've always wondered at the beginning, or at the end of part one even, uh, the bad guys just come out of nowhere out of that sort of um, uh, barn, out of the brewery even. You know, there's supposed to be three walls, and they just come out of the walls on the, the one side, which always makes me, you know, makes me kind of chuckle and or smile a bit, because it's like, wait, what? where do they come from? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just feel like UNIT don't really do much, uh, besides obviously fight a few people here and there and, and that, and that's about it, really. I mean, they have one big, fairly epic bit, but besides that, UNIT just don't feel that, that, um, uh, impactful or, like, they have that much purpose there. Um, the situation with the Brigadier is that, you know, the controversial bit at the, at the end is, um, you know, should he have died or should he have not have died, you know, uh, and that, I mean, Ben Aronovich should have either stuck with him dying or should have not stuck with him dying, you know, one or the other from the get-go, um, he was very <sighs> dithery in terms of doing that, like, originally, I think, if the Brigadier, uh, character, the Brigadier's character was gonna die, um, and that, and then, obviously, at the end, he rewrote it and sort of said no, so he doesn't, um, unfortunately, as cool as the Destroyer is, he's not used that much at the end. At the end of the story, he is just sort of fairly quickly defeated, and that, and which is a shame considering how epic he looks, how cool he looks, and that, um, just sort of, you know, a lot of money, I think, probably was put into his costume design and the animatronics for the mouth and that, and, uh, unfortunately, he gets wasted and defeated fairly easily, and it's not like they reuse it. Uh, the costume for later stories, I don't think, although the sort of Curse of Henrik's bad guys, yeah, there could be a bit of an overlap there, maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, even though I'm not a massive fan of fantasy, I really like this story, and I, I don't know why, I just have a big soft spot for this one and an affinity with it, um, and a bit of an emotional connection with it, maybe because, again, it's one of the earliest Sylvester McCoy stories I got, um, you know, in my collection and first watched, and there's a lot of humour, but there's a lot of dark stuff in in there. Um, yeah, really good story. I'd give it, I'd give Battlefield a seven out of ten. Thanks for watching. Comment, rate, and subscribe.